couple of announcements. Uh, men's prayer breakfast will be on Saturday, February the 10th, which is a week from this coming Saturday. The um, day after that, which is Sunday, February the 11th, will be our annual congregational meeting. And so it's always interesting to hear the different reports of what's going on in different segments of the ministry. And, um, and then the church votes, we need a quorum, so those who are members need to make an effort to be here. Then um, we'll have a, uh, this uh, conference the following week, which deals with just supporting Israel, understanding why we as Christians should support the Jewish community and support Israel. And so we'll be talking on that. And initially, when I was setting this up, I wasn't going to have Bible class on, on that Tuesday night. But then I realized, well, that would be the only time that week I would teach if I taught. So maybe I ought to teach that Tuesday night. So I am. And I'm going to teach on Romans 1.16. What does it mean to the Jew first and also to the Greek? And so that will be challenging. And in there, we are going to talk about what the significance of missions to the Jews are, what the significance of evangelism to Jews, what the emphasis is, or what, what the principles are. Because it's come to my attention over the years that a lot of people don't understand that when you talk to Jewish people or you talk to Muslims, you've got a lot of, of, what's the right word? You have to uneducate them first before you can educate them because of all of the things that they've heard and all the things that they've been told. And a lot of people think in many ways that in evangelism, even if you just go to some country in Africa or in South America, that you can just go down there and start telling people about Jesus. No, you can't. I mean, missionaries have been doing this for, for 250 years in the modern missions movement, and they've come to understand that you have to train people. They have to learn a culture. You know, in the early church, they knew the culture. They knew what the problems were, and they addressed them. But, you know, you go to a lot of places in this world uh, where people think really differently than Western European Christian, Judeo-Christian influenced white people. And they have a lot of misconceptions about things. And so you have to learn the language. And if you know anybody that is bilingual, just ask them, is it true that other languages really do express their worldview through their language? Because each language is different and it expresses worldviews. And if you're going to be a missionary in some country, you have to learn the language. You have to learn what the worldviews are in that country. You have to learn about the politics. You have to learn about the exchange rate for money. You have to uh, understand what the taboos are within any culture. Uh, you go into some countries, you, let's say you have grown up in a culture in Texas where you learn Spanish and you learn certain words. And those are just fine words. They're socially acceptable. But you go to Puerto Rico and use those words, they're going to kick you out of the house. Because in that culture, the same word is, is taboo. It's, it's profanity or worse. And, and you have to, missionaries have to learn that, way, that thing. And when you're talking to anybody who comes out of another culture, you have to understand that culture so that you can communicate and not trip all over yourself. And a lot of people trip all over themselves um, I, I won't say that I have done that. I took a missions course. I'm off topic here, but that's okay. It's fun. I, took a, I had to take a missionary elective when I was in seminary, and there was only one elective in the semester I needed to take it, and it was on cross-cultural ministry. I hardly knew what that was. And if you've known me for very, lo for very long, you've known that I had a, have had an extensive ministry in black churches. I've had an extensive ministry with Jews. I've had an extensive ministry with people in Eastern Europe who come out of either an atheistic Marxist background or they come out of a um, uh, orthodox background or they come out of a legalistic uh, Eastern, 
you know, Eastern Church Baptist is not the same as American Baptist, and they're very legalistic, and they believe that you can lose your salvation. And if you believe in eternal security, you're a hardcore Calvinist. We don't make that issue on eternal security. So I have spent a life that I never expected working with people coming out of different cultures and subcultures. And you have to learn a lot, or you, you, you can really say a lot of things that are offensive that you don't know are offensive, and then you gotta deal with that. So uh, I'm gonna talk about those things on that, uh, that Tuesday night. So we're gonna do that, and then um, Olivier will be here to talk about uh, what's going on with uh, anti-Semitism just since October 7th and how, what, what the trends are there. And then uh, your manager will be here on Thursday night, and then we'll go over to Beth Yushern on Friday night. And I hope some of you will stay for the Shabbat dinner afterwards. That's, that's, that's a real cross-cultural experience. I remember going to Israel uh, with an APAC group of ministers in, uh, I think this was about 2012 or 2013, and one of the things we did, we were invited to the home of, of a couple, both of them professors, one of them professor of Hebrew and uh, Old Testament teaching, uh, Orthodox Jews, and we had um, a Shabbat dinner. And, um, you know, all of the things you had to be aware of if you were going to go and not do something that was offensive to the host. Not that they would get all upset. They were very, very gracious but I think that uh, we're just not used to sort of the ways that they do things. So we'll talk about some of those things. I think that'll be good. So that's on uh, when, uh, Tuesday night the 13th, Wednesday 14th, Thursday 15th. So that'd be a full week for us. And um, you I need to sign up. Please sign up. Please email us. Um, people are, say, have, will say to somebody or say to me, uh, we're going to come. Sign me up. No. I'm not going to sign anybody up. I'm not going to remember your name by the time I get out the back door. So you need to uh, you know, go back there and write out your email address and your name, and that'll take care of that. All right. We need a few moments of silent prayer to make sure we're in right relationship with the Lord. So if necessary, to confess sin, and then I will open in prayer. Let's pray. Father, we're so thankful that you've given us this time to be able to focus upon your word and understand the, the broad framework of scripture, the, uh, the meta-narrative, as it were, the big story, to see how the details fit and how, as, the, as you go through the Bible from Genesis to Exodus and on, that, that, that the, the significance of what is taught is expanded and developed so that it's not just... Um, uh, different stories that don't seem to fit, but that it, they reinforce what's been taught before and add something as you go through through the scriptures. And we learn about you and we learn about your graciousness to us and your power and your plan and all that you have provided for us. And we learn about just how uh, terribly sinful we are and corrupt, and yet you love us with an infinite love and have provided a perfect salvation for us that is not dependent at all on who we are because, frankly, we can't even begin to think about measuring up. So, Father, help us to understand these things as we review and go forward tonight. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Okay, we are in the 12th lesson, and the 12th lesson covers Passover, and we looked last time at the first part. I changed the 12. I thought I changed the A. It's 12B, and it's on how God saves. So last time we looked at how God delivered Israel through the Passover, and this time we're going to fit that within a broader pattern of Scripture. So what we have seen is in human history, ever since the fall, and it must be understood that the fact that it is Satan that plays a role as he takes on or indwells the serpent, that this introduces a significant theme that runs through Scripture, is that human history is influenced by Satan by the devil. 
And we have to understand what the Bible teaches about the devil because you hear a lot of people who teach all kinds of things about Satan and the devil that aren't biblical. They're, they're just superstitious and they're mystical and magical and all kinds of things. And we'll get to that eventually. But that's what empowers false religions. And as the Bible says, the real powers behind the idols and the false gods and all of the different pantheons of all the different religious systems on the earth are demons. It is, there is a demonic force, and we see it ev working every day, but a lot of people are just, just blind to that. So we have the pagan kingdom of man on the left. It's based on works. Man can save himself. Man's basically good, and man can bring in a utopia. And this was what they wanted to do at the Tower of Babel. It was the first real example in history of internationalism or globalism. And God came down, probably just went cluck, cluck. This ain't good. And he changed everybody, changed up the languages so that people could not gather together because what they wanted was to uh, build a name for themselves and a kingdom for themselves instead of serving God. And we're reminded that we were created in the image and likeness of God for the purpose of serving him. And Egypt is just the next manifestation of that. So we're going to go through Egypt and we're going to see uh, later on, we're going to see other uh, nations that come up, the big ones will come up later, Assyria and Babylon and Greece, uh, Persia, and then Greece and Rome. The kingdom of God, on the other hand, is based on grace. God is saving man. He, they, he has offered to save man. He has done what is necessary to save man. And it's not based on what man does, but on what God does. So to bring about that ultimate spiritual salvation, God... Uh, stopped working through the Gentiles, and he said, I'm going to start a new, a new group. I'm going to start a new people, and it is through them that I am going to uh, give my revelation and that I am going to provide uh, a Savior. And as I look at this, and, and it, this is a whole other topic, but what I realize is that as you go through these different periods of time, which we call dispensations, there are different scenarios in each time frame. And what God is demonstrating is there's no such scenario that man can come up with that will work. That God's used all these different scenarios and they all fail. Because ultimately, it's be not the environment, it's not education, it's not money, it's not the kind of government or politics you have. It's that the human heart is corrupt and evil, and that no matter what is done, even in the church age where God provides so much for someone and the, uh, and the solution of salvation is so clear, it's going to end up with a huge amount of apostasy. So God continues to uh, initiate grace. So we're looking at the Exodus and the judgments in the ten plagues, as I said, uh, are types of the final judgment. So we looked at the outline uh, on uh, the first part. It was about the plagues. And we looked at the tenth plague, which is the Passover. And that there were five lessons on Passover. These are the five. We only got through the first two. We looked at grace before judgment, and that is that God always gives people enough information and enough time to make a decision uh, positive toward him, to desire to know him and to obey him. And th there's always grace before judgment. And for our human individual human lives, the grace that we have is the length of time we have on the earth. That God has, Scripture tells us, and we can see it, around us that God has revealed himself through his artistry known as creation. And if you go to a museum such as the Louvre in Paris and you look at these great works of art, then you know that there is something to produce that beauty, that there's an artist that put time and effort and genius into what was produced. And the same thing is with the earth, and you get down to the details. I've been listening to some uh, creation DVDs that I picked up recently, and uh, you know when when um, Darwin came up with his magical theory of evolution, 
they thought that the smallest thing uh, there was was a cell. Well, a cell is made up of numerous uh, smaller uh, items. You have DNA change, you have protein change, you have all kinds of things going on inside the cell. And each of those uh, elements has, is packed full of information. And one day we may even discover that some of these things have even more information packed within them. And the chances, even when all you we knew was what we knew in the 50s, the chances of something coming together and, and um, going f and causing some, th some event that would suddenly, by chance, evolve from organic, inorganic life to organic life uh, was virtually impossible when you look at the uh, probabilities. Now it, it's, e it, it's even worse, and since the late 80s with Michael Behe's book that came out uh, on design and others, these were secular scientists who realized there is too much information and organization in all of creation for this to be by chance. It gives clear evidence of a designer. But if you have, you're dead set on not having a personal infinite God, then you'll never accept that, that evidence. So God gives us our whole life to come to terms with his presentation of who he is. And as we've seen in Romans 1, he says that there's enough evidence there that the visible creation uh, we can see the invisible attributes of God. In the visible creation, we can see the invisible attributes of God. And yet, um, people suppress that knowledge in unrighteousness. And the result of that is that they are without excuse. There's enough evidence to convict them. So we looked at these five things, grace before judgment, uh, whom to save and whom to judge, and we stopped right before we came to the third one, that there's only one way of salvation. The tenth plague is a beautiful picture of sa salvation and the work of the Savior. That which provides the saving element is a lamb, a lamb that is without spot or blemish. That lamb had to be chosen and had to be uh, selected because it fits certain qualifications and that the fact that it was without spot or blemish was to picture a savior who had to be without sin. And then the uh, lamb would be sacrificed and the blood of the lamb would be smeared on the doorposts and the lintel of the house. And this is a picture of how Jesus saves. It is through the shedding of blood. We're going to learn a little bit more about that phrase. I've always pointed out that this is a phrase that indicates death. It's a metaphor for death. It's not talking about um, bleeding out. Uh, it is talking about our, our hemorrhaging to death. It is talking about a violent kind of death. What we learned tonight from Leviticus is that uh, states that the life is in the blood. So it's, the shedding of blood is a picture of the shedding of life, therefore death. So we have to think in terms of these as idioms that had, uh, had a significant meaning. So the uh, lamb would be selected on the 10th of the month and then observed for, ten, for four days, and then on the 14th of the month would be killed at twilight. So when the blood was applied, then the people in the house were safe and secure because it's not, the lit, it's not that literal blood, lamb's blood that saves them. It is God that's saving them. It is God who keeps them safe. And it didn't matter if they were in the house, what they thought about anything or what their opinions were about anything, but because they were in that house, they were safe and secure. And that's a picture of our salvation is once we trust in Christ, we're saved because God keeps us, God saves us. You don't save yourself by not committing certain sins, not having certain thoughts, uh, not saying certain things. You are saved because Christ paid the penalty of sin, complete and total. So uh, when God came to take the life of the firstborn throughout Egypt, all of the Jewish houses had blood on them, and he passed over. 
And so that is the picture of the cross. So, God was saying that for the firstborn to live, there must be a death. And it's substitutionary. That's the picture. So in every house, either the firstborn would die or a lamb would die as a substitute. So that is the picture. So God would accept the death of a substitute in the place of the firstborn. So these are the five lessons that we learned. Grace before judgment, whom to save, whom to judge, and only one way of salvation. So there was grace before judgment, before the flood. This sets up a pattern. You have how did God deliver at the time of the flood? How did God deliver at the Exodus? How is God delivering through Jesus? So the global flood, they had uh, at least 120 years of a grace period. It was actually longer than that because Enoch, who was two generations before Noah, was preaching grace at that time. So there was a long period of warning. Uh, at the Exodus, it's the whole period of the first nine plagues is an opportunity for the Egyptian people to recognize that the God of the Jews is much greater than any of these little made-up gods of the, of the Egyptians. Look at what their God can do. And, um, and so they had that, that warning period. When Jesus saves, the time period is our lifetime. The Bible warns us, and believers of Jesus warn us. There's enough evidence in God's creation to hold us accountable. So, skipping ahead, when Jesus saves, uh, God did, we have to recognize this whole pattern here, that God did not create the world with evil in it. Evil came because uh, human beings with volitional choice, responsible choice, disobeyed God. So normal was in the perfect environment of the creation between the creation of everything and the sin of Eve and then Adam. After that, everything is under a situation of deterioration, decline, and death, and it is a time of abnormality. There will be a judgment at the end of history, the great white throne judgment, and there will be a separation of good and evil. Good will go to be with the Lord, and evil will be restricted to eternal punishment. So we're in that grace period. And from birth to death, that's our opportunity to trust the Lord or not. Uh, what we'll see is that there is a place of the dead in the Old Testament. We'll come back to this later. And uh, there's the story of the rich man and Lazarus. We touched on it last time. We'll come back to it again uh, this evening. Second, whom to save, whom to judge. In the global flood, they saved those who listened to God. God said, I'll deliver you if you go get on the ark. There was only one ark, one door to get in, and they had to go and do it God's way. It may not have made sense to them, but the idea it was going to rain didn't make sense to them either because Scripture says that before the flood, the earth was watered from the mists from the deep. It, it didn't need to rain. And it rains after the flood. So they, were, uh, they had to trust. And those who trusted were just Noah and his family. Everybody else uh, stayed outside the ark and suffered the consequences. In the Exodus, the firstborns were who had families who put, applied the blood to the doorposts were saved, and those who did not were judged. And when Jesus saves, it will be those who trust in Jesus as their substitute lamb will be saved, and those who are, do not will be judged. When Jesus saves, it's very simple. You have to believe he is who he claimed to be, and he if you believe him, and he did what he claimed to do, that is to, to die on the cross for our sins, and that he, because he is eternal God, and in him was life, and his life was the light of men, he can give us life. And so, John 3, 16, whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. John 3, 18, he who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is already condemned, because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. So this brings us to our uh, outline for tonight. Um, 
we're going to look at three, four, and five, only one way of salvation. Uh, four is man and nature were impacted by sin and will be impacted by salvation. And fifth, how to be saved is by faith alone. So in terms of the only way of salvation, we just reviewed this, that there is only one way, and at the flood it was the ark. In Exodus it was applying the blood of the sacrificed lamb. And when Jesus saves, it's believing the substitutionary death of Christ is the only way. Now Jesus said to Peter and to Philip, who are two disciples, this was after the, or in the upper room, and he tells them he's going away. Peter said, well, Lord, we don't know how you're going, but how to get there, what's the way? And Jesus said, I am the way. The, I am the truth, I am the life. Three profound claims. He claimed to be the way to God, the one and only way to God. Second, he claimed to be the life, that he is life, and in him is life. And he claimed to be uh, the truth, the embodiment of the truth. So the question is, what kind of person is going to make such audacious claims like that? Who's going to claim that? Is, is he, he telling, is he crazy? Why would we, he say that? So we only have three options. The first option is he's a liar. He is a bold-faced liar. He's intentionally lying. He's just deceiving people. But the evidence of his life and his teaching is not one that it's a con man. Second, he's a psycho. He actually believes that he is able to save everyone and that he is eternal God. Now, nobody was going around saying, oh, we need to just lock you up. We need to find a straitjacket because you're obviously gone over the edge and you're a psycho. Nobody said that. And all of the literature that we have that survived from that period, from the Jews that, that were against him, not one person ever said that he was a crazy man. They just rejected all of his claims. So your third option is that he is someone who is speaking the truth. And if he is speaking the truth, then he is the only way to God. And he said, no one comes to the Father except through him. Later, this will be developed that he is the mediator. He is the go-between. Uh, scripture says in... Um, in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 4, uh, that there is one God and one mediator, and the mediator is the man Christ Jesus. So what are we trusting when we trust in Christ? Well, we're trusting that he is the creator God, that he is the creator God. He says, he, and we'll look at a verse on this in just a minute, that he is God, that he is a second person in the Godhead, but that he is fully God and he is the creator. And in First John's, I mean, in John's prologue, in John chapter 1, one of, the, one of the things that he says is that Jesus was the Word and by him were all things that were created and nothing that was created uh, was not made by him. So second, Trusting that he died as our substitute, that he was in our place. He took upon himself the death penalty of sin in our place. And third, trusting that he conquered death. He rose from the dead on the third day as he predicted and successfully took care of our sin problem. Now, there's always people who come along, well, the disciples stole the body. The disciples never believed in a resurrection they were scared to death when after Jesus was crucified. They thought they would be next. So they had no thought about that. And when they rose from the dead, they didn't believe it. Uh, they just didn't uh, grasp what he was saying. Bottom line is that we do not save ourselves. We cannot save ourselves. Christ paid the full penalty. At the end of John, in John chapter 19, where you have the description of the cross and what Jesus says on the cross, the last thing Jesus said was to telestai. It is finished. Now, that's a really important phrase. It's so important that when John writes his gospel, he says, when it was finished, to telestai. When it was to telestai, Jesus said, to telestai. And whenever you have that kind of repetition that close together in the scriptures, God is saying, pay attention to this. 
What Jesus is saying is it's complete, which means you can't add anything to it. He completely paid for sins. There wasn't some sin that shocks you. It wasn't some sin even later denying that you ever believed in Christ. Oh, I don't believe that garbage anymore. It doesn't matter. You're saved. You're saved not because of you, because you were never saved because of you. You were saved because of Christ. You were saved because of what Christ did on the cross, and you trusted in him. You're saying, well, you know, people, people often change their mind. Well, God doesn't change their, his mind. God is not a man that he should lie or the son of man that he should repent. He sticks to his word because God is omniscient. Therefore, he knows everything is going to happen, every thought you ever had. He knows all the good thoughts, all the bad thoughts, all the nasty little thoughts, all the secret thoughts that you ever had. And he died for those. And you're not going to have a thought that he didn't know ahead of time and didn't put on Christ on the cross. So God imputed all of our sins and they're completely and totally paid for. And that's why Jesus could announce as the God man, it is done. It's paid in full. It's over with. I've done it all. Nothing can be added. So we trust in Christ. Christ keeps us. God keeps us. We don't keep ourselves. In John 10, 28, 29, and 30, often, and in the promise book, I have 28 and 29 there, but the, the, the third verse, 30, is really important. It's one of those short verses in the Bible that packs a punch. Jesus said, And I give them eternal life. And they shall never perish. No one shall take, snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hands. You see, the issue isn't our weak, little, pusillanimous, impotent power. Well, I can't keep myself. I, I, you know, I just can't keep... Acting good, it, you never you were saved by acting good. You were saved because Christ died for your sins. Isn't that great? He paid the penalty. That's how much God loves us. And how do we know that Christ can do this? It's that last verse, 1030. He says, I and the Father are one. He's claiming to be God. People say, well, that's, that's audacious. And you'll hear liberals say, well, Jesus never claimed to be God. And I always wanted to reply, well, I guess you never claimed to be very smart either. <laughs> Jesus claimed to be God, and he does it right here. And you know what? What does the next verse say? Can anybody tell me what happens in the next verse? The Jews in front of him the Pharisees understood exactly what he said, and they reached down for stones to stone him right then and there. They weren't stupid. They knew he claimed to be God, and in their eyes, that meant blasphemy. So it, that's the point. It is Christ. It is God who keeps us. This is what Jude says. Jude was the half-brother. He was the brother to the humanity of the Lord Jesus Christ, the half-brother, and he said in his, the closing verse of his epistle, he said, Now to him who is able, that, word, that talks about the omnipotence of God. He is able to keep you from stumbling. He is able, not you, not me. But he's not only able to present, prevent us from stumbling, he can present us faultless before the throne of grace. Isn't that remarkable? See, we, we're all messed up with our sin natures now, but when we die and we get our resurrection body, we're going to be face to face with the Lord, no sin nature. We will be presented faultless before his throne, before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. And then he closes by saying, to God our Savior. That's another clear statement. God it, there, I think this is a plenary use of the word us. It refers to Father, Son, and Holy Spirit because all three of them were involved in our salvation. To God our Savior, who alone is wise, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. It's God's power and His sovereignty. 
that he is able to do that because he knows everything so he can have a perfect plan of salvation. So we see this parallel. Global flood, if man is um, disobedient, does not believe in God, does not rely on God to save him, then the global flood was the penalty and they all died, all but eight. And at the Passover, those who did not apply the blood to the doorframe, they, the oldest child died, the firstborn. And then at the end of life, if we have not trusted in Christ, then the penalty is eternal death. But God, gives, God loves us. He's provided a solution all along the way. He provided the ark. There was room for many more. But only eight took him up on the offer of deliverance. Uh, the Passover lamb, all of the Jews, as far as we know, uh, there were no Jews that did not apply the blood to the doorpost. And every Jewish family survived. And many, um, many Egyptian families as well. How do we know that? Because we read the verse last week that when they came out, they came out with a mixed multitude. That means there were not only the Jews, but there were many Egyptians who had trusted in Yahweh for their salvation as well. And so today, those who trust in Christ dying on the cross, they have eternal salvation. So there's a thought question because we live in a world of pita, and there are those who think that just uh, uh, drinking milk somehow is, uh, contributes to uh, unjustified harm to animals. And so the, here's this issue. Now, we have to think about this a little bit. So who created the animals? God did. Very specifically, very intentionally, gave them specific design. He created sheep. Sheep are one example of animals that disproves the entire theory of evolution. Because sheep cannot survive without a shepherd. Sheep cannot survive without a human being to take care of them because they are the dumbest animals on the planet. They, they can be standing next to water and die of thirst. They can be standing next to food and die of thirst. They can't figure out how to do anything. They have to have a shepherd. They're totally dependent on human beings. So if sheep evolved, let's say 30 million years ago, and humans didn't evolve, start evolving until you know, 10 million years ago, then how did sheep survive for 20 million years without somebody to protect them? What about the wolves? What about T-Rex? He was a carnivore. Lamb chops. Mmm. So we have to think about the question because God designed everything the way it is and he created it knowing full well that man was going to sin and that he was going to have to teach human beings about his grace. And he needed the perfect animal to demonstrate how really dense and stupid people were. And so he created sheep. And I say this all the time. God calls us sheep. That includes pastors. It's not a compliment. It's not because we're white and fluffy. It's because we're dense. And how many times do we tell God, I'm never going to do that again? And the, that is always the same sin. And God, in his omniscience, says, you've told me that about 4,500 times, and you're going to tell me that about 9,500 times just in the next year. Not to count the rest of your life, but guess what? They're all paid for. Genesis 126, God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. So man is made as a finite representative of God. He has in his immaterial makeup the qualities of, of uh, volition and mentality and understanding right and wrong. All of these things he has He's a reflection of God. He was designed to be a reflection of God, and he was made in the image of God to rule, which is what the mandate is, to rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and over the cattle and over every creeping thing on the, on the face of the earth. Animals were not created in God's image. They have life. 
but they don't have, they're not in the image of God. They have what the Old Testament refers to as a soul, but they don't have, the soul is not in the image of God. So they are a step down. But if you believe in evolution, then all life would go back to our chain of being that we used at the beginning. All life is on this same chain of being, and it's, it's one level of being, and each level as you go, go up, it, you just get a little more of something, but you're all in the same thing, and you evolve. So man is an animal. You remember hearing that, your first grade, second grade, all the animals, man is the smartest. Well, I'm offended. I'm not an animal. I was created in the image and likeness of God. I am a human being, and a human being is not related to animals. You'll, you'll also read some, I'm not going to go into this, you'll also read some stuff where they'll say on the whole DNA chain, uh, it's 98% similar to chimpanzees. No, it's not. They haven't gone through every detail on, in the DNA chain, number one. And uh, num number two is... They, they ignore the fact that, let's say you're going to have a couple of elements in your DNA, and this is going to inform your stomach to do what a stomach is supposed to do. And God, anthropopathically speak or anthropomorphically speaking, went, what a good idea, a DNA chain. I'll just use that same pattern and stick it over here in a monkey and stick it over here in a horse because the stomach does the same thing. So I don't have to reinvent the wheel every time I turn around. And so, of course, there's going to be certain similarities in the DNA change. But it's just like men and women. Oh, I can't use that anymore, can I? It's just like men and women. It's not what we have in common. It's the differences that are important. We ha we're having to learn that. We're so smart. We're having to learn that all over again. So God creates mankind to rule over the animals. Man's created in the image of God. Animals are not. Man uh, made for a relationship with God. Animals are not. Man is made to rule over the animals, and animals are to be uh, under the authority of men. After the flood, God says, Every moving thing that lives, uh, lives shall be food for you. I have given you all things even as the green herbs, but you shall uh, not eat the flesh with its life, that is, its blood. So they're supposed to eat meat. Now, if I don't mean to offend you if you're a vegetarian. You may be a vegetarian for a lot of health reasons. Maybe you just you have problems with your digestion or whatever. But if you do it for philosophical or religious reasons, you're a blasphemer to this. You have rejected the Noahic covenant. You, God says, eat meat. You're saying, no, nah, it's not good for me. I got all kinds of reasons why it, it, it's just not right. You say God was wrong. And that's a real issue. God said eat meat, and God knows what he's talking about. He created your body. Now, you're corrupt. The meat you're eating is corrupt. Everything's corrupt. So I understand that some people just have trouble digesting meat and things like that. That's why I said... If you're doing it for a philosophical reason or a religious reason, then you are violating the Noahic Covenant. If you're doing it for a health reason or because that's the way your body is, I understand that. Um, you know, as you get older, you don't do so well with eating some kinds of food. So um, I, I understand that that's not a problem. Leviticus 17.11 for the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make atonement. So God knew that he was going to have to teach things. You know, God's knowledge is not learned. He never increases in knowledge. He never decreases in knowledge. So for all of eternity, if your mind can grasp eternity, he has always known that the second person of the Trinity was going to go to the cross. And he has always known that he is going to have to teach the human race, the bunch of sheep that they are, what this is going to look like. And so he designs sheep and goats in order to be the example, in order to be the visual training aid so we can understand what's happening on the cross. 
So God is saying that mankind is more valuable than animals. God, God is saying that animals are not in the same chain of life that human beings are in. Human beings are to rule over them. And if I say it's good to eat meat, don't contradict me. That's not a smart thing to do. So now we come to the fourth one. Man and nature are impacted by sin. You know, the worst ecological disaster happened when Eve ate a piece of fruit. It started the whole thing. And it's the result of disobedience to God. And then the first, the first judgment that really came following their spiritual death and separation from God was the flood. Look at the disaster that man brought on the earth because of his rebelliousness against God. God had to remake the whole earth. Everything was devastated. That's what wiped out most of the dinosaurs. You had a few that went on the ark. And um, in the post-flood environment, they just couldn't survive. They survived in some places. Uh, there are books out that trace legends within a, 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 a hundred years or two or three generations of Europeans going to South America or to North America of animals in the living memory of people, people that were there when, when the Europeans came, within the living memory of their grandparents who saw dinosaurs. We have dragons, pictures of dragons. China has all kinds of dragons. Well, when you find a skeleton can you tell me what color the skin was? No, you can't. Can you tell me if it was scaly or not? No, you can't. You don't have any evidence. All you have is bones. But those bones, if you put them in the right shape, they could also be the bones inside of what we picture as a dragon. And you have all kinds of stories, especially Scandinavia, Britain, and others, of, of um, uh, people within the last two or 3,000 years who fought dragons. And so there's, people say, well, how could human beings and, and dinosaurs live together at the same time? Let me ask, how, do, how would human beings and lions and tigers live together in the same time and, sp and space? They wouldn't. They didn't live in the same time and space. They just lived at the same time in different areas. But they didn't live in community with, with one another. Same thing with dinosaurs. They had their place and humans were in another place. So uh, we see that man and nature are impacted. The global flood changed nature and the environment. And at the Exodus, the physical environment of Egypt was destroyed. Now think about the ecological damage that God did to the planet through the plagues of Egypt, where he turned the water into blood and he then multiplied the frogs and they multiplied the, the gnats or the lice or whatever they were. And then he brought fiery hail. I mean, this was an ecological disaster and the Egyptians didn't recover from it uh, for uh, a couple of centuries fully. And their, their military was devastated, their leadership was devastated, uh, their agriculture was devastated. Now what we see in this chart is that the Creator God is the one who created man and created nature. What I don't like the term nature, I prefer creation and animals. And because of sin, they're all fallen. God saves us. But what we're gonna see is the cross also provides for salvation for the planet and for the environment. So in the text we read in the Exodus, God physically removed the Israelites from slavery in Egypt, and in saving them, nature was severely impacted, such as the waterways of Egypt, animal life, crops, plants, and trees, and even the weather, as I just pointed out. Romans 8, 20 and 21 says that the creation, going back to the fall, the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, I mean, you, you, creation doesn't have a volition, but it was judged because of sin. So God subjected it 
because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. Now, we've covered this in earlier lessons, but I find it unusual and always surprising that there are people who don't realize that sin didn't just mess, mess you up between your ears spiritually. That's a really platonic concept. It not only messed up your soul because of spiritual death, your soul connects to your body through your brain, and that's corrupted. And the, your whole body, everything that n provides nourishment for your brain is corrupted. And everything that all of that food comes from is corrupted. It, the weather's corrupted. The weather uh, climate change has been going on ever since Genesis 3. So we have to recognize that when God, when, when Christ comes and he is manifested, the next verse says, that's when the creation will be redeemed. And that is what, what the text says. So the bondage will cease at that point. That happens at the second coming. So when Jesus saves, there are physical changes to the world and uh, spiritual changes to the world. So in terms of physical changes, uh, God eventually will remake the planet. In 2 Peter 3, 5, and 6, there's a renovation that takes place here. Uh, 3, 5 says, For this day, that is the pagans, willingly forget that by the word of God, by the message of God, by those taking the, the course on the, Messiah, on the life of Messiah, the Memra, that's the Aramaic word for word of God, uh, and applied to the logos of God. It is the word of God, the heavens were of old, and the earth standing in the water and out of the water, that's Genesis 1, by which the world that then existed perished. That's the Noahic flood, being flooded with water. But the heavens and the earth, which are now preserved by the same word, are reserved for fire until the day of judgment, and perdition of ungodly men. See, that's interesting. See, the heavens and the earth which are now here are preserved by God's Word. When you and I trust Christ as Savior, we are preserved by God's Word. It's God's power that keeps us. Revelation 21, 1 through 3 talks about the new heavens. John writes, Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no more sea. No more salt sea. There's water. There's rivers, fresh water. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle, that is the dwelling of God, is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people God himself will be with them and be their God. Now, the interesting thing there is that what comes down from heaven is the new Jerusalem to the new earth, and God comes down to the new earth, and God dwells on the earth. So you're not going to spend eternity in heaven. You're going to be, spend eternity in the new heavens and the new earth, on the, on the new earth. So this is the timeline. You have a perfect world from the creation to the fall, then you have the ancient world from the fall to the flood, the present world from the flood to the future judgment of fire, and then the new heavens and the new earth. The physical and spiritual change uh, takes place in us. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things are new. Uh, old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. 2 Corinthians 5.17 in 1 Corinthians 3, 16, we're told that in our body dwells the Holy Spirit. Do you not know that you are the temple of God and the Spirit of God dwells in you? And in 2 Corinthians 1, 22, we're told that God has sealed us and given us the Spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. So we're indwelt by God, the Holy Spirit. That's part of the sealing. And that is a guarantee that we're going to be saved. So if you trust Christ as Savior, what happens at that instant is God the Holy Spirit takes up residence in us. And guess what that means? That's God's seal that, and guarantee that we're going to be saved. It has nothing to do with what we do. Now, people say, well, 
then I can just sin all I want to. Well, there are going to be consequences if you do that, and you're going to destroy your life. You have to live for God now, but that doesn't mean you can lose your salvation. Okay, so we are down now to um, uh, talking about the body, continue to talk about the body. Jesus is in his resurrection body when he appears to the disciples, and he says in Luke 24, 39, He's, they, they can't believe that, that he, he's there. You, well, we saw you die. So he holds out his hands and he, and he says, look at my feet. You can see the nail prints. You can see the holes in my hands and in my feet. A spirit does not have flesh and bone. Notice he doesn't say flesh and blood. That's important. He says flesh and bone. Um, a spirit does not have flesh and bones like you see. Flesh and bone are physical solid matter. Philippians 3.21 talks about this new body that he, he will transform our lowly body that it may be conformed to his glorious body according to the working by which he is able even to subdue all things to himself. So it's his work that does it, not our work. 1 Corinthians 15.50 says, Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God nor does corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. My favorite story about that is the sign that goes up in the nursery over the babies. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound. This is at the end of the church age. This is what it's called the rapture. And the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we, that is those who are not dead yet, shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortality must put on immortality. So what we have is uh, God's plan is for us to get a new spirit, regeneration, born again, and a new body. And then he will, that leads to resurrection. So this brings us to the fifth point of comparison of the uh, of exodus to the flood is how are we saved? How, how does God deliver people? It is by faith. The global flood, though Noah believed God and trusted God in order to be saved. He had never seen it rain before. He had never seen it flood. But he built a boat, a big boat. And he had never thought about herding so many different animals together. And God brought them to him. He trusted God. And then when the, everybody was on the ark and all the animals were on the ark, this text says, doesn't say Noah closed the door and sealed it. It says God closed the door and sealed it. See, that's another picture of our security and our salvation. Is God's the one who seals and secures us, not us. And so we're saved by faith in Exodus, in the book of Exodus, and the event of the Exodus, both Moses and the people showed that they had faith in God. They had to trust him. Moses had to believe that God would do everything that he said to do and that God would allow the Israelites to get out of Egypt safely despite the, all of the opposition from uh, Pharaoh and his chariot corps and everything else, Moses had to believe that and trust that God would deliver them. The people had to believe that the slaughter of the lamb and the smearing the blood, or literally the word meant to strike the doorpost, so you just strike it like if you've ever painted, probably when you were a kid, the first time you got paint on a paintbrush, you hit it. Well, that's what they did. They were, the word there was to strike. So they dipped it in the blood and they struck the doorpost. So um, the people had to believe uh, that the slaughter of the lamb and the application of the blood to the door frames would save their firstborns. They did it. They all did it. That's why I believe that the, that the entire Exodus generation, there may have been a couple of exceptions, kids, families that were in the house, but they really were skeptical of what was going on. But the households applied the blood. 
And I, I think the Exodus generation, as messed up as they were later, as rebellious and disobedient as they were later, they all had trusted God and were saved. I think that's very clear. The people had believed over and over again. It says the people believed God, as you read through the, ex uh, the text of Exodus. So at the Red Sea, each person had to have faith that God would save them, and they went across the uh, went across on dry ground. And um, they had been trapped, but they believed that God would deliver them. So Exodus fourteen thirteen, Moses said to the people, "Do not be afraid. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord." That's a great promise. When you get your back up against the wall, when things are going bad and hard things, this is a great promise to remember. I need to just stand still and let God deliver me. I need to get right with God and let him do his work. The Lord will fight for you and you shall hold your peace. See, God, God is looking at them. And he knows all the things they're going to do. That when he takes Moses up on Mount Sinai and gives him the, the law, and he's up there for 40 days and 40 nights. They're, they're going to bribe Aaron and they're going to pressure him and intimidate him to build an idol. And then they're going to have an orgy for weeks. They're going to put the later Greeks to shame. They're still saved. God, that's God's grace. Did they get punished? Yeah. Yeah. So when Jesus saves, it's blood atonement. In the Old Testament, it is that, that blood represents life. Leviticus 17, 14, for it is the life of all flesh. Its blood sustains its life. Therefore, I said to the children of Israel, you shall not eat the blood of any flesh, for the life of all flesh is its blood. Whoever eats it shall be cut off. So they're supposed to eat meat, but not with the blood in it. Guess what? When you go to the meat market and you get a raw steak, that's not blood. That is something similar that has a pink color, but the blood's been drained from the animal. You know, I've gone deer hunting for the last 40 years. And after you uh, kill the deer, you eviscerate the deer, you field dress it, you hang it up and let all of the blood come out. And then when you cut up the meat, you put the meat in water and let the water further pull all the blood out. So when you, people say, well, should I eat a rare steak or not? Sure, that's not blood. That's another uh, compound uh, that is, uh, has a red color, but it's, it's, and I can't think of the name of it right now, something globin, like hemoglobin, but it's not hemoglobin. It's, it's a relative of that, but it's not blood. So you can go back to eating a good rare steak. You don't have to burn it to death and make it medium rare. <laughs> Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death. What he, when you work for a wage, you've done something and you get your payment. And the payment for sin is death, spiritual death and eventually physical death. So God has to deal with that death and put that death penalty on someone else in order to save us. And that's what happens at the cross. Without the shedding of blood, without the physical violent death, there is no remission. So Adam and Eve sinned. The consequence is death, spiritual death first, then physical death. And that means that there must be a death or shed blood. So we think about this all the time when we talk about crime, that somebody steals and then they get punished as long as they didn't steal anything that was worth more than For those of you who aren't paying attention, that's, that's what the law is in some places. That, oh, no, we're not going to arrest you or anything. You can get $950 for free, and after that, well, we'll slap your wrist. But somebody steals, there's a punishment, and they go to jail, or maybe they pay a fine. And that's considered to be a fair or just penalty. Scripture says, for it's not possible that the blood of bulls or goats could take away sin. So there has to be something more permanent. So here you have the Egyptian situation. The firstborn is under a death curse. And if the blood is applied, 
then the firstborn doesn't die. And that's a picture of the ultimate covering, that Jesus' death is our covering. Man will not die and will not have eternal death. So the issue is our response to the Word of God. We can harden our heart like Pharaoh and say, no, I really don't believe that. I can save myself. I'm good enough. Or we can humble ourselves and say, you know, Lord, I'm, I've done a lot of things that aren't right. I've thought a lot of things that aren't right. I've said a lot of things that weren't right. And I can never save myself. I can never be righteous. Isaiah 64, 6 says, all of our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. The best we can do is just, it, it, it doesn't measure up. The standard of God's righteousness is 100 miles high, and the best we can do maybe is to jump up to a one millimeter. We're a long way from being up to his standard. But he provided the standard at the cross. And so we either harden our heart and reject it, or we say, Lord, I'm going to humble myself and trust in Christ alone for salvation. There's no neutral ground. We come to passages like Isaiah 55, 10, and 11. For as the rain comes down and the snow from heaven, and do not return there, but water the earth and make it bring forth in bud, that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater. God then says, So shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please, and it shall prosper in the thing which I sent it. So that is how God saves. Now there's a couple of sections at the end of the chapter that I want to take some time on. We do not have time to go into those tonight, but these are questions that people have. And the questions are, well, where do people go when they die? What happens when somebody dies physically? Where does their soul go? We know their body is either cremated or goes into the ground in a casket, but what happens? And then the second question uh, that is addressed in the, in the curriculum is what happens when either a child or an infant dies or what, hap what, what if they're just not mentally competent enough to understand the gospel? But I have known of children who are not very mentally competent, have Down syndrome or whatever, but they can understand the gospel. Ultimately, the answer to both these questions is if God is the God of the Bible, he is just and righteous. That means he knows all the facts because he's omniscient. So whatever he does, it's going to be the right thing. And when we're absent from our self-centered sin nature and we see all the facts, no matter what they are, we're going to know it was the right thing. But we'll get into it next time. We'll look at what, what about those who either, you know, not those who never heard. We'll touch on that. Uh, but those who, who are incapable of having ever understood the gospel or been able to trust in Christ because of uh, mental competence issues. So we'll address that uh, next time. Father, thank you for this opportunity to look at the way the picture of salvation is portrayed through the Passover as well as earlier through the flood to review that and to see that you have a pattern of one way that you design a plan of salvation, you execute the plan, you provide and protect those who have trusted in you and they are delivered. But it is important that your instructions are followed completely. And so the issue for salvation is simply trusting in the promised and provided Savior to believe that he is who he said he was, the eternal God-man, and that he did what he said he would do, and that is to give his life for the sheep. And that by trusting in him, the Gospel of John uses that word, over 95 times, believe, believe, believe. Just believe that God, Christ is who he said he was and that he paid for your sins. And that's it, because we can't do anything to save ourselves. 
Jesus did it all. He paid the price. He said, it is finished. And if we believe that, then we're saved forever and ever. Nothing we can do to can change that. So, Father, we thank you for such clarity in your word. And we pray that those who need to hear it will hear it. And those who uh, have doubts about salvation uh, will have their, their certainty strengthened. And they will know that God is the one who keeps us. And he is the one who will be able to present us faultless before your throne. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen.